Moby Frankie, thank you for making the time. Thank you very much for having me. So, uh, Moby Frankie, you were born on a Civil War hospital outside D.C. where toys are rare. Moby gets straight to work on his career, making things out of wood. At age three, sells his first piece of art for $75, which goes towards groceries. After his dad leaves, his mom is invited to the Caribbean island, St. Thomas, to be an illustrator watercolorist. Although Moby finds joy in working out uh, working out of his mom's art studio, life is still difficult. Moby hitchhikes to school, does poorly, is beat up for being the only white kid, and after Hurricane Hugo hits, drops out of 10th grade. Moby gets his GED, uh, and after breaking up with his girlfriend at 22, his brother rescues him by showing him that he can get financial aid and go to art school like his brother. Moby learns color theory and nothing digital, saying, quote, you can't understand color if you can't touch it, end quote. Still living the artist's life at 29 with a broken shard tooth poking out of your mouth, <laughs> unable to afford a dentist, September 11th, the financial crash and a girlfriend breakup uh, hit hard. Out of the blue, Moby gets a call from Pixar thanks to an art school friend and gets invited to show his portfolio. It's not good enough, but eight months later, um, working and building your portfolio up at your uncle's house in Berkeley, Moby gets another call from Valve, again thanks to an art school friend, but this time with a job offer. While working under Victor, uh, Victor Ant Antonov, uh, who is leading art design for Half-Life 2, Victor is pushed to incorporate London, Edinburgh, and an adventure stories like uh, Melville's Moby Dick into the world of Half-Life 2. Uh, it switches Moby's attitude about the video game world when you realize uh, you can blend uh, his love for analog oil painting into this emerging digital medium. Moby goes on to lead art direction for Team Fortress 2, then works on titles such as Left 4 Dead, uh, Dota 2, and Portal, the gun, uh, during his 11-year tenure at Valve. In 2013, Moby joins Riot Games and leads as art director for their League of Legends game, and then moves to leading a team of 90 artists working on R&D projects that will shape the, uh, the future of esports, dancing between uh, the DNA of design, narrative, and art. Moby's vision can best be explained through his own words to create, quote, memorable, timeless visual design that complements gameplay clarity, end quote, which you have. So uh, that's my monologue. Moby How did Frankie. you know that? How I, did you get that out of, out I of me? I cyber stalked you for a week. <laughs> there's, some, there's some good things about that. Uh, you, I think you got it down to about 90% accuracy. Um, I wasn't the art director. Well, I was, I was the art director on League of Legends for a little while. Um, I be, then became principal art, artist for uh, about two years on it. Um, and I was born in um, Washington, D.C., but that's about it. <laughs> but I did grow up in a Civil War hospital. Yeah, the Civil War hospital. What exactly? Yeah. It, any what, more? Well, well, the thing is, is like, what is a Civil War hospital? Right? Oh, that's true. Everything was a, uh, churches and uh, everything. Right. Everything. So this was actually a farmhouse that was built in the 1700s. So growing up as a little kid um, in rural Virginia um, in this stone house with <laughs> many ghosts, if you understand what I'm saying, right? Like, who knows how many people died in that house was a little bit of a creepy situation. So my dad would always say, don't go up to the attic. Don't, because there's something up there. <laughs> so it's like, as a little kid, you know, at five years old or six years old, I think I was five, yeah. I moved to the Caribbean when I was five. Um, you had these pictures of what that might be. And so one day, my brother and I, we go up there just, you know, to be a little rebellious. And we walk up, open that door. And as you would even understand, it's exactly what you think. An, an attic that your dad is telling you, don't go up. And there's meat cleavers up there. Because back in the day, you know, that's where you dry your meat. So there were meat hooks up there with actual meat from, who knows, maybe it was the 20s, maybe it was <laughs> like, and so you just see these things up there. There was a, you know, an, an old uh, spinning, uh, 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 a weaving wheel, you know, all these like antique things and vast cobwebs. And it was, it was enough to trust our father in that situation. <laughs> so speaking of creepy ghost stories and upbringings, uh, we talked off camera. Uh, is is suffering needed for art? Absolutely, suffering is needed for art. Yeah, yeah. You you have to be. The thing is, is this is something that I love about Riot in a in a in a way is that they truly respect the art and they understand that suffering is a part of that. They understand that like they 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 value the art. Um, 
and they give you that time to figure it out, right? Um, but that's the thing. The thing is with, with artists is that it's not about money, number one. It's not about money at all. It's, it's, we have this, we have these, like a spirit in us that needs to get this stuff out. And if we don't, then we become depressed, we become alcoholics, drug addicts, whatever, right? Homeless. And if we succeed at it, then we, we do great. We do great things with it. But it's not a monetary aspect. It's, it's really, it's a creative thing. Just as a musician, right? Musicians need to get that out and you want to succeed. And there is a little bit of ego involved in that, but it's not something that is going to jeopardize a, a foundation. It's really creating the foundation. My thing when I'm, as an artist, and at least in my career, is that I figured out that like I like supporting people. Um, I love art. I love doing art. Sometimes I need to take time for, for tea to not do art. Um, sometimes I want to support from below and um, support a team, you know, and, and, and get things uh, together in a band-like mentality. Sometimes a sports-like mentality, but more a band-like mentality because I think art is more analogous to that. You know, when, when you're when you're jamming, you know, with a guitar, with a drummer, with an organ, you know, it's almost analogous to like, you know, like the Beatles, for example, right? Like every member of that uh, that band, that team, knew how to play the the mu- you know the musical components, so they could like taste test in a sense, or at, le- at least give like examples of why, you know, maybe maybe try maybe try you know this type of uh, piano chord rather than this one, right? And so, I don't know exactly where I'm going with this, but let's, let's, uh, let's tether back to where you're going. Well, I'll go to um, uh, the artists. Um, you got 90 artists working with you, or under you right now, in which that uh, more of your job is uh, you've been doing lectures, but then also you've been working with those artists to help develop their careers. And as you said, like, are you harnessing their inner suffering, or is it also just getting them to work together? Because I think you talked about that with DNA, that it really yeah. is being able to bring, you know, with the Beatles, like bring your expertise of, of all of your stuff, but then really be able to listen to the other aspects of it. Uh, Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So um, supporting people, uh, one of the things is I don't want people to waste their time. I want uh, you know my fellow artists to uh, make sure that what they're creating doesn't get thrown out, that it actually has uh, staying power, it sticks. Um, how do you get there, right? Measurement devices. Um, you know, I want I want to catapult us as a team to to create what is going to be the next great thing. Right, and I have to be there on the floor to make that happen, and um, not just provide examples, do the work. So one of the main points and kind of the most significant significant things is having skin in the game, being there, being accountable. Number one, right? Like I'm going to be the fall guy. If this thing fails, guess what? That was my fault, right? If this game fails, if the art direction fails, I'm the one accountable for it. But at the same time, I'm on the floor with everybody else doing exactly the same work that they're doing. Um, at the same time, you know, uh, I, I might be creating characters, but at the same time, I'm going around and making sure that things are working holistically, you know, orchestrating, you know, uh, the, the thing that makes people, you know, their best, you know, and, and you know, just keeping your eyes like, well, this little color on this. <laughs> This little part, that's that's distracting, right? If you make your highest area of saturation there, then the player is going to want to go over there. Don't put the saturation there, put it over here, right? So it's like, it's just adjusting. There's a lot of adjusting, there's a lot of talking. So having, um, having good communication skills, verbal skills, and at the same time, like being able to let your guard down, right? Like I'm extremely friendly with my coworkers. I don't... Uh, I'm never, I, I never blow up. I, I, I'm never, you know, caustic or toxic or anything like that. You know, I just, I, I want, it's, it's super, uh, it's a very fragile place in a sense, right? Because everybody's laying their, their best out on the table. They're trying to do their best. Everybody's trying to do their best. And so it's like, you've got to make sure that 
you know, everybody's coming in and making their commitment to doing something, and you you, you want to make sure that everybody's doing it, you know, and um, you don't want to be that person with an ego coming in like, this was my vision, Arr! you know, it's like, no, no, I don't, sometimes I'm like, guys, I don't know exactly what we're doing here, you know, let's, let's come up with some stuff, let's, let's problem solve, let's jam, let's, let's, let's get the feelers out there. And, you know, maybe there's, a, you know, my friend Theo, he does fantastic, you know, concept art. Uh, and, you know, Jeffrey and uh, Bimar and, you know, a bunch of other guys. Like, these guys do some fantastic art. And it's like, sometimes I'm in the wrong. And they'll be like, I'll call you out on that one. I'm like, point taken, you know. But at the same time, it's like, the, the reality is, is we come in, um, we're using our brains and our muscles to create a product, you know, and um, it's very important to to make sure that you feel good when you come in. That's, an, that's one thing, right? It's like you come into work, you want to give it your all. You don't want to come in exhausted. You don't want to come in like, oh, my gosh, I don't want to be here. You want to make sure that the, you know, the place is... How do you create that environment? By letting your guard down. You know, by by letting uh, everybody have a voice, but at the same time, knowing that there is that accountable person. So I'm that guy that is going to be like, at the end of the day, I make that decision. Um, I'm best to make the right call. And if I do, then it's a high five. We all, you know, but I'm the guy that will make that in, in the end. But at the same time, I'm calibrating um, the teams to make sure that, you know, read hierarchy, right? Uh, the thing that you look at on the picture plane, right? When you're playing a game, it's not that you're looking at a 3D experience. You're looking at a, you know, it's literally just a 2D thing. It's just this flat surface, right? It gives the impression that it's a 3D thing. But the reality is, is that it's it's 2D. But there are these moving po- components, but there's a, a background, right? Uh, there's a middle ground, and then there's a foreground, and that's all that there is, right? And so, depending upon the game, right? So, League of Legends, right? League of Legends is a um, a fantastic example of read hierarchy, right? Because we clamp the, the values, and by values I mean uh, lights and darks, right? So white representing number one, and black being number eleven, right? On that that scale. Now the background is at the value between, let's say eight or maybe seven, <laughs> I'm getting a little nerdy here, but between seven and maybe five or, or six on the, on the value scale, right? And then the characters come along and they're at the, um, the 11 to two uh, value scale. And then the VFX come along and they're at the value of four to one. So it's like all of these, and then of course the HUD, right, uh, plays the other part which is the, the readability of everything, right? So it's the orchestration of readability because we as human beings are very visual, right? Especially when you're playing an eSport like League of Legends. It's like it's super critical to have all these moving components because as uh, the players and the fans look on or play the game, whatever, right? It's like it all has to be representational. And then when you have these groups of 5v5 coming right together at this you know, crescendo a mo- moment. It's like, it's very important. Now, you're not going to get it all 100% perfect accuracy, right? Because VFX, there's going to be shit blowing up. But at least you can tangibly see what's going on. But we're, that's, that's the thing, is that we're, we're constantly judging, um, measuring how you, the readability of everything uh, corresponds. I mean, you go to black and white a lot. Uh, your silhouettes um, with Team oh, Fortress yeah. Two, like yeah. you wanted to make it recognizable, so that when people just saw the silhouette, one, mm-hmm. two, um, I, I, you'll have to remind me of the names. But there are math equations in which that became the foundations in which that you created um, for the characters. So everyone had kind of a rim highlight, yes. um, and the the shading was all done through. Um, I gotta get the names. The fong right. shading. Uh, fong shading. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Oh, Gook, Lake, and Barla. Yes. And then uh, the art direction from the 1920s was uh, Leyendecker. G.C. Leyendecker. Yeah. Uh, it was G.C. Leyendecker. It was uh, Mi- Michael McNola, mm-hmm. like the comic artist. Um, 
and Dean Cornwell, um, Hayao Miyazaki for the, the backgrounds. I mean, that was, you know, we started on Team Fortress 2, let's see. I mean, originally it was when I first started at Valve in 2002. Um, but after Half-Life 2, we actually really began the groundwork on um, figuring it all out. Our thing was is that, and I think that was something that I really loved about Valve, was that we didn't look in the game, like the game universe, right, or the game industry for inspiration or art direction. We looked outside of it, and there's like a universe. It's amazing. It's, it's almost like you live in L.A., right, and you're like, oh, I want to go see the stars. Not the movie stars, but you want to see the stars up above you, right? And you can't because of the smog, right, or the light pollution. But then when you go out to, you know, you go out to some place in the desert, right? You look up and it's like, boom, you're like, holy shit, it's all out there. It's a big, you can see them, right? You get out your telescope and then you can actually do the research on what's up there. Um, it's really the same thing. It's like when you're, when you're in video game land, right? You're like, oh, well, you know, Fortnite, let's say, is doing a great, <laughs> it's doing great. So everybody else is like, oh, no, we got to chase we got to use what Fortnite's doing. We got to look at Overwatch. Overwatch. I mean, here Overwatch. It's like I. Everybody says Overwatch. It's like I'm. I'm really hungry. Overwatch. I got to go to the bathroom. Overwatch. <laughs> it's like everything's. There's an. The, the Overwatch is used so much, in the game um, universe. Um, but it's like, where did Overwatch come from? I, I want to actually ask. Where's that? Fortnite Because it's Team Fortress Two. Like there were a lot of paladins. There were like so many different games that were going on, yeah. and it was such yeah. a long process. And you also had Titan, I think, as well. There were games that like came and went, and so it was something in which that Overwatch was a span of what ten years or ten something years, like that, yeah. with Team Fortress Two kind of coming as well. So mm -hmm. it's a really interesting development. What are you allowed to share about that kind of world from your perspective? Oh no, I mean I'm I'm super like I love the fact that Overwatch is like done what it's done yeah. and uh, the visuals are great and I, I love the art direction of it um, and the gameplay I mean I see co-workers playing it all the time um, my thing is is that when looking for said uh, visuals please don't look at Overwatch I'm saying go outside and look at you know maybe what uh, they looked at, right? Or, I mean, it's even analogous to, you know, when I came to, to Riot, there were some art directors that were like, oh, hey, we're, we're using TF2 as a, you know, as a possible, you know, art direction for something. I was like, don't do that. I was like, look at what we looked at. <laughs> Please look at what we looked at. Like When Team Fortress 2 came out, you had testers, and they said it was terrible, and they were angry at you. Absolutely. And then they wrote letters afterwards saying, we're sorry, yeah. you're right. Yeah. Um, which is essentially your job now again, which is you can't do the same thing that everyone else is doing. You have to look outside and you have to do the thing that people are going to scream and yell of like, that's not what I want because all they know is they they want a faster horse. Absolutely. Well, there's going to be the people that, I mean, there's there are people that follow trends, right? And then the trendsetters. Now you look at guys like James Brown, right? Uh, bro shattered, right? James Brown shattered in the 1960s, like the you know, the funky music, right? Bob Marley in the Caribbean, right? That's another person that I love very much because it's like, that guy, it's like, <laughs> changes the entire, would you rather that or would you, do you just want mediocrity, right? Like somebody just completely just doing the same thing over and over again, right? Rather than freshness, right? Changing, uh, sea changing uh, events, right? Um, and that's uh, that's another thing, like with focus groups, you know, when you're working on R and D, it's like, what do you think about this? People are gonna be like, ah, it doesn't look like this other game. I don't like it. And people are like, we well, gotta change. It shows that we're insecure, right? It shows like, well, we're not sure if we can do this, right? It's like, or let's 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 take a risk here. Let's. I think if it's if it's something where the art complements the gameplay. If it really does, truly, then it's going to it's going to work, rather than like shoving that that art on top of the gameplay just because, you know, players might like it, right? And then it totally screws with clarity. I, uh, you don't want that. It's the it's the DNA that you talked about. Like they all have to kind of intertwine. Yeah, um, yeah. 
design, not, uh, art, and narrative, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it goes back to the point when you were talking about the people who um, in your team that ultimately you're the you're the guy whose neck is on the line. You give away credit and you take all the responsibility. Yeah. So I guess my question to you is, if if it's something that you believe in and it is like out of left field, um, are you able to push it through? And, and uh, even though the the studies say like, oh, this isn't what we want, but you have the clarity of like, no, this is what you do want. Like, does Riot trust you enough to be able to push it through? That's a good question. Um, uh, we haven't. I mean, there's. I think. I think in a sense, yes, yes. But at the same time, I do understand focus groups because there's different regional things. Like TF2, for example, probably doesn't do well in certain regions, right? Like, I don't know that. I knew that it did well in North America and Europe, right? But in in Asia, maybe it won't, right? Because there's a certain taste that's involved there, right? Um, I mean, there are nine characters in TF2 um, that are, I mean, not broadly appealing to everyone, right? I mean, number one, like, we didn't have any female characters. <laughs> you know, it's like, we could have had female characters. We should have had char- female characters, right? Um, and maybe the, I mean, the pyro might be, I don't know. But, like, yeah. So it's, it's uh, focus groups are are good, but I just don't want it to be a thing that jeopardizes like a very strong art direction if that's the if that's the case right uh, again like the, the video game industry um, there are artists there are or are art like movements that actually are moving the needle um, they're more indie of course but then when you think about like the whole pop art experience of art and games, you know, finding that recipe of uh, what's broad appealing, right? But with within the context of like retaining um, that that special something, you know, it's a hard nut to crack. <laughs> well, it's okay expanding to uh, a global audience because, or, or just even uh, domestic but global as well. Because you think about it, uh, China is three or four times more of a of a revenue earner. I mean, Tencent uh, from China, yeah. and so you do have to think about that. But at the same time, you can't think about that when you talk about getting art inspirations out in the world. All right, you go surfing, you go running on the beach, whatever. And so you have to pull from that. But then it does have to kind of go through the process of like, all right, how do we include this kind of group? How do we include this kind of group? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah no, it's a it's a <laughs> it's a scary thing to uh, to walk down. Um, and there's no guarantee. There's never a guarantee. There's no guarantee that anything, even the game that you think that you're working on is going to be, you know, a success. You just kind of, you know that it might be really fun, but you just don't know. You just, you just never know. I mean, every game that you work on, every game that I've worked on, I mean, which has been a plenty, <laughs> they're like, there's just no guarantee. Like, the only thing that you're, you know, you're like, everybody's uh, enjoying it on the team could it? Would it? Maybe? Like you're, we're all kind of like in agreement that this this feels right. Um, this is challenging the convention, as the terminology goes. Um, it's gonna it's gonna add this new layer of something to the experience that people you know are lacking in other games, right? So it's like if that might be the case, right? I mean PUBG, right? Like. That's a that's an that's a great example of of a game that like, I mean it it it, it exploded, um, and then, <laughs> eh, you know I mean, it it diminished very quickly, right? Um, so it's a really coming. I mean they had a great recipe, but other games have obviously you know capitalized on that as well. So uh, who knows. <laughs> So you touched on that you've worked on a lot of different games, and you are in the R and D department in which that you have to kill your babies all the time. Yeah. So, uh, what what has most of your DNA in it that either will see the light of day or won't see the light of day that you can talk about? What's my DNA? Yeah. Or what what has the most of you? I guess uh, that's published. Uh, I mean, League of Legends. Yeah. Uh, I mean, as far as Riot's concerned, yeah. I mean, most of uh, I spent most of my time on League of Legends uh, for the last, uh, for the first three years, you know, helping uh, upgrade uh, uh, Summoner's Rift update. Um, 
helping out on you know the champion team, uh, the champion update as it was back in the day, and uh, skins and all that stuff. Um, and then after three years, jumping onto R and D. And so for the last two years now, it's been working with uh, you know a variety of different R and D teams, and uh, you know I can't say much about it. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll try. Phil, Phil Hale and uh, Hayao Miyazaki. What do you yeah. love about him? What I, okay, so Hayao Miyazaki, um, what I love about him is uh, true craft, like a craftsmanship uh, approach, um, you know, not just storytelling, but a, a, a unique uh, art uh, representation. I mean, Spirit, if you ever watch Spirited Away, Jesus, I mean, it's like, it's a person that's able to retain the childlike qualities of imagination, which is extremely rare on a person in their, you know, say 50s 60s 70s right it's like and yet they can do that it's a very rare thing um phil hale who i've met uh, a, a variety of different times uh, and we we nerd out about um kind of i mean he's he has he has a he has a um i wouldn't say a dark darkness about him i think it's a realist way about life and uh and he's he calls me out on shit. <laughs> I'll be like, oh, I like Landecker. And he'll be like, oh, I feel bad for the guy. I felt bad for the guy, you know, because Decker, it, it seems so struggled and, 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 and constrained. And, and then when I look at Phil's work, it's this, you know, like, I mean, his old work was, my gosh, it was like, you know, you had these robots and this guy, you know, punching out the robot and it was all graphic, right? Now his new work is like car accidents and abstract, right? And using fantastic variations of color and value and ratios of value and ratios of, um, of color, right? And it's like this guy is using uh, his brain and his muscles to create something that's very unique. Um, and it's, it's unique to meet, I mean, I've met Hayao Miyazaki once, very briefly, he signed a book for me. I was very happy about that. Um, and then, yeah, with Phil Hale, you know, it's like to meet these guys in my lifetime, which I never thought I was gonna do. Um, wow, <laughs> it's amazing. So uh, what makes an oil painting great? But then also, uh, y- you talked about that almost restrictive versus kind of almost uh, uh, impressionism kind of stuff um who's doing stuff that you wish well i guess phil hale a little bit but like who's what studio is doing stuff that you wish uh that you could do but is completely not your wheelhouse oh my god that's a great question i don't know um of other studios that are doing things that i wish i could do um i mean valve i i still look at valve and i'm like you know they're doing some great things. Um, I think that Riot, in a lot of ways, is doing some of those. I mean, they embrace a variety of different art mediums. I mean, people are doing oil, people are doing gouache, people are doing, uh, I, I mean, I, I love traditional because it is timeless. It's actually the one thing that is actually tactile. That's the thing about oil painting, right? Like, if you go to a museum, like some of these paintings are hundreds, if not, thousands of years old, right? Who's to say how long, you know, a printout <laughs> is going to last, right? Or digital in general. Like, everybody's like, oh, no, it's going to go on, withstand the test of time. We don't know that, right? Um, but oil paintings, for me at least, are like the most, if done right and cured right and painted properly, uh, can hold up for thousands of years. And uh, uh, that was one of the reasons why I was doing oil paintings uh, at Valve, you know, I did a, a, a painting of the pyro, of the heavy weapons guy, and archival, you know, lead-primed canvas. God, I mean, lead is toxic, obviously, but when you cure it, right, when you spray it or, you know, fix it and everything, you're not going to get any of that. But it stays. It holds up, and it'll hold up for, you know, hundreds, if not who knows how long. But those representations actually stay on. So I don't know how, like, years, centuries, or decades and centuries, or whatever, after TF2, is remember, they'll be like, oh, what the hell was, what's that? <laughs> it's like, 
a guy with a gas mask or a gal with a gas mask with a, a flamethrower. <laughs> oh, it was a popular video game 400 years ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's, who knows? So speaking of legacy, like you kind of have shaped the art, um, the look and the feel of esports. So you've got Dota 2, you've got um, Half-Life, well, Half-Life 2 went into a lot of different things, and League of Legends. And now with the R&D projects that you're working on, I'm sure are going to be pretty influential. So, um, yeah, I guess you, you've really shaped kind of the look and the feel. And I talked about the studio, but who? it's important for you to look outside. Who else is looking outside of the bubble and is doing something completely different? I know that there's a, was a bobblehead. There was a video game that was like a 1920s car- cartoon that was completely different. Um, I forget that. Anyways. Oh, gosh, I don't know. Okay. Anyways, um, the last the the one game that I saw that really influenced me was uh, Inside. Do you ever see that one? Uh, it was uh, released on Steam, and it was a side scroller. It was absolutely stunning in its visual representation because it was it was all grayscale. It's all uh, black and white ish, and the character there's one character he's he has a little bit of a muted red. It's a little boy, and he has to go through this who knows what kind of world, and it's done so tastefully. Um, and it has like a, a vintage feel to it as well, but it, it's a classic game. Like, and they worked on it I think for five years or so, and it's totally worth it. It's an amazing game experience. I was going to ask you about that of uh, noir and black and white because you always go back to black and white to yeah. make sure that it works. Yeah. And so that's a game that stands alone just as black and white. Yeah, with and it, yeah, yeah. It's fantastic. Uh, but yeah, if you if you and I build all the games that I work on in black and white first. And then, and that's a wonderful thing. And, you know, it's always funny because, like, uh, the people above us are always like, uh, I'm only seeing gray. I'm getting, I'm starting to sweat on the inside, right? They're getting a little, like, I'm not seeing, I want to see the finished thing. And you're like, hold it. Wait. <laughs> hold it. Because color is literally like the icing on the cake, right? Um, color used selectively and intentionally to make sure that you draw the viewer's eye or the player's eye to a, you know, to those crescendo or important places. Uh, right now I'm like looking into my eyes or into my brain about what I'm working on now and I have to really be careful because I'm like, I could say spill the beans, but I'm not going to, all right? But, um, but yeah, it's like you, you work in grayscale, uh, you figure out your compositions, your read hierarchy, right? The primary, secondary, and tertiary reads. Uh, silhouetting of characters, um, gradations of uh, darks to lights and areas of contrast. And then after that, you know, and then there's animation involved, right? There's all these different things. And animation, you know, people will see a concept of a character and they're like, you know, we need more detail. I'm like, ah, or let's let's do a, let's do a, uh, you know, let, let's do a mock-up, right? Let's, let's rough shell that character into the game and let's do an animation, right? And you see that character run around and you'll never see those details because it becomes an impression, right? That character is bouncing around in front of you and um, all that detail stuff is not really important, right? Getting the impression of the detail is important, but not actually the, you know, these, these small little noodly bits because that's actual pain when you see that you know it's it's a it's a it's a form of pain when you see all the the little noodly bits of something rather than like a clear silhouette that's intentional and easy for you to figure out right and that's why i always say you know by definition clarity is the quality of being easily understood right without ambiguity so you talked about zones and photography and exposure, whatever. So background is usually seven, eight, just a little bit darker, but then also uh, making things pop, like uh, immersive detail and iconic simplicity. Mm-hmm. How do you help? I mean, because you talked about with movement, it's like uh, that gets lost once you start moving, once once you yeah. zoom out, whatever. So how do you help communicate that? And how do you find that blend between immersive detail and iconic simplicity? Well, every single game is very different, right? Um, a MOBA, for example, is, you know, you're looking down, number one, right? So characters, you're seeing them from up above, right? And I mean, on Dota 2, that was the first time I dealt with that and I had no idea what I was doing. I was like, oh my God, I have to design, you know, know, Valve 
we're all working on, you know, baby, basically FPSs in a sense, right? Like, so you're always seeing your characters in a, a variety of lighting conditions, distances, and viewpoints, which is just, it's, 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 it's its own horrific challenge, right? <laughs> and then here's this very simple problem, but it's also extremely complex too, right? Because it's like, it's this graphic read. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's one thing, but like, yeah, figuring that's, that's the thing I love about game design in, in a sense is that every single game, every single genre has a completely different, um, adjustment to its read hierarchy. So a first person shooter is extremely different from a MOBA, but at the same time, it does embrace the understanding of value control. So with a first person shooter, for example, you probably don't, and it depends, like if it's a, uh, if it's a, an eSport type of thing, right? You want it to be very clear and easy. If it's a horror kind of game, you want it ambig- a very ambiguous type of thing, right? Where monsters jump out of the shadows and scare the shit out of you, right? Um, but in eSport, everything has to be like super specific because it's not just for the players, right? But for the audience as well. Like the audience is going to have to see this and understand very clear what's going on. And they'll enjoy that experience, right? And as the player would as well. So solving those things, you know, game by game, it's, it's always been a very interesting challenge. Is that hard to communicate to artists who just want to, who are suffering and want to express themselves, but like, no, I need this detail. But you're like, it, it's not going to be seen. It's going to be it's, lost. It's always been a challenge. Yeah, no, it, it, that's the funny thing is that, yes, I mean, it's, it's a, it, you have to be selfless in this situation, right? As a gamer or as a game designer, game artist. Um, I mean, I consider myself not an artist uh, or an illustrator in any way or form. I'm a game designer. I'm a, I'm, I'm helping out solve a problem with everybody else in an orchestrated way. And uh, if I'm the, the guy that's like, my vision is working on the details to tell a story, it's like, no, no. Look about, you know, the, the fact that we have, you know, 300 characters in this game or whatever or 15 or or 25 whatever right and they all have to be orchestrated perfectly with the environment with their weapons right um with the hud all those things not and and of course like the game design itself like that all has to be perfectly um mechanized to work together and if you can't if you don't do that you're not gonna you're going to stutter things. It's it's not going to be clear. Um, it's not going to be... Uh, I mean, there's so many different components that go into it. My thing is, is like manufacturing. I love the manufacturing component of, of creating a game, right? Making it actually scalable, right? Creating uh, tangible um, ways of, you know, being able to say, this works and this is why it's going to work and it's going to carry us for the next 30 or 40 years on that specific game. You can actually do that. And if the game is a huge hit, then you have all the manufacturing components. It's, it's almost analogous to creating a, a bicycle or a car, a fax machine, whatever, right? It's like coming up with those lathe things. <laughs> fax machine is so obsolete, <laughs> I love it. But it's like, th- that's the thing. It's like coming up with, you know, the blueprints that actually make it scalable. So you talk about manufacturing, you, you, you're optimizing, you're an operations person and, and thinking about the next 30 years, but what projects uh, are, are financially a disaster, but you would love to still do it? It would pr- prove no financial success, but it'd be hell, hell of fun to work you on. You mean outside of gaming or inside of gaming? <laughs> inside or out, either. Working in video game? My God, it's like, it's amazing, right? Because you can you can reach millions, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of people. Um, and if the game is true to what its intentions are, like, that's a, that's a win right there. If it's not, then it's, it's just not gonna, it's not gonna happen, right? It, it, it has to have the, the intentionality of what it was set out to do, um, regardless of if the art is quality or not, right? I'm not a person, I, I believe in, um, when you create a game, make sure it's fun first, right? I always say ugly, 
but fun, right? That's, that's the key indicator of a successful game. If it's ugly, but it's fun and people want to come back to it and play, you got yourself a hit right there. Easy. I think that's actually something that, that Valve did really well and has done is, uh, you know, we would take mods, incorporate them into the company, and then we'd take that because they were fun and iconic and scalable and then build off of that, you know. Uh, creativity is a way of life. How do you live it? Oh, my gosh. Well, I mean, there is a, a saying. What is the saying? It's, um, oh gosh, I can't remember the... There, it's such a great freaking saying um, that pretends to creativity. That is, it's kind of like doing things over and over again is not creative, right? Like that's anti-creative. So actually doing, I think living a little bit of struggle is part of that that creative. Like my thing is, is that I, I don't have a car. I live in LA. <laughs> I drive uh a motor, uh, actually no, no motorcycle, a bicycle. So I have two bicycles. Um, I don't eat meat, you know, I eat vegan. Um, I eat less than more. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm at the point in my age and in the, in, like, in the industry where um, I see a lot of people coming into the industry and I'm like, all, all of my learnings that I've done within the, the past 17 years or so, 18 years, um, I want to help guide them through. So that's kind of the thing that wakes me up in the morning and create cool shit too. But at the same time, I'm like, I want to be there, you know, kind of as a, as a you know, foundation for them in some way to help them, you know, solve these problems and, and get things out the door. How do you keep a living game growing in the right direction? Oh, man. And, and imagine that. So it's... it's um, Keeping a living game, right? Like that's you don't want to ever be calcified. That means that like you, you know, you might say, you know, put that, you plant this stake in the ground. We will never do this. It's actually no. You probably will have to change, right? You're probably going to have to. So keeping, um, I think Riot has done a fantastic job with League, right? Like I, I have, you have to give credit. I, I see these guys working so hard. It's actually it actually makes me tear up. Because it's like these guys are working, like guys and gals are working so hard to um, to make that that game, you know, keep going and keep serve. It's not even it's not keep it thriving. It's it's, but it also takes bringing, you know, the younger generation coming in, people that can actually forecast what this next generation comes in, right, with different types of tastes. Um, you never want to just like, you know, if somebody has an idea and be like, that's a stupid idea. No, <laughs> actually, that might be the best idea in the house, right? So always making sure that, oh, that, you know, this could be a, this could be a, a really good thing. Um, yeah, so it's, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's allowing for the foundations of the, I don't know, the game or the living game uh, to stay put. However, knowing that everything and anything could be uh, taken out or replaced because in order to make it go, you can't let it calcify and you need that fresh blood. You need those new ideas in which yeah. that are coming out of left field right. to be able to keep it fresh and alive. And the intention, right? Uh, I mean, you look at what happened with uh, Disney, for example, right? It, it went through a, a fantastic period and then like, I think it was like in the... Uh, late 70s, early 80s, it kind of went, started getting a little soft, right? It, it you know, it kind of lacked the vision. Um, and they've obviously pulled themselves together, um, especially like digitally and whatnot. Um, but, you know, I think as long as a game like League um, has that original intention, um, and the thing I love about League is that it's branching out into a variety of different places and I can't say much about that but it's it's doing some fantastic things and um, you know being relevant because there are, there is so much there's so much of a world <laughs> and it's like I get to see that you know, there's so much of a world out there that people don't see and they will see at some point that it's it's gonna be truly you know unique and 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 wonderful and that game deserves it. 
for sure. I'm excited, and I'm excited to be able to have you talk about it uh, freely. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait for that day. Um, what art streams do you pull from for inspiration? Um, I tend to, you know, there is a thing about looking at the current. There's also about looking at the past, looking at the foundation. So I, I tend to go towards the past um, because you might have a current artist, right, who's fantastic. It, it, and it's usually outside of the digital realm as well. That's something because there is no control, alt, delete, right? There's no, like in Photoshop, you can, you can just pirouette and fail, pirouette and fail. You can just control, alt, delete and do the brush stroke, right? But when you're actually doing like fine art, <laughs> you lay that brush stroke down, right? You smudge it with your finger by accident or whatever the case, or the painting falls down and you're like, that's it, right? So I, I tend to go with the hard, the hard stuff, right? Like the, with the oil painting, with the gouache. Um, and I look at current artists, but I also look at who they're looking at and then who those people were looking at. And that's my fun thing. It's like going on that journey, um, going to uh, museums, going to libraries, um, going to galleries. You know, nothing wrong with current stuff. Um, but then just research it. Research the, that current artist. Look what they're looking. Uh, there's one of my friends, his name's Jeremy Lipking. He's a fantastic representational um, oil painter, does fantastic uh, portraits and landscapes. Southwest um, kind of things as well as of recently, um, but he looks at a lot of the artists that I've looked at, you know, in the past, like Dean Cornwell um, and a variety of others, um, Sargent and whatnot. But it's like, yeah, but he's taking it in a completely different realm, right? So it's you just use people like that as an as an example. <laughs> it's it's remarkable. It's it's going to the source. Uh, because when you do copy that new person, the fact is is that, yeah, they are an amalgamation of all the different sources that they're pulling from. So when you go straight to the source, you end up also discovering something that, that no one else is seeing as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we're all, you know, we're all humans and, you know, nothing is created within a vacuum, right? It's not, as an artist, it's not like, oh, this is my, it came from me. No, no, it comes from, it comes from the foundations, right? These people actually were the ones, or the people before them, right? Everyone is, you know, I mean, go back to the, the cave paintings, right, in France, right, or Spain. It's all graphic uh, representations of, of tribal people, you know, and these amazing animals, right? Like, they're telling a story. Uh, that's graphic. That's pretty awesome. And then throughout the last, you know, 50,000, 60,000 years, here we are, right? Um, so, and that harkens back to like the, the artist ego. I mean, sure, artists are going to have a little bit of ego because it's like, they're, they're kind of proud of, about doing something really hard. It doesn't like, a lot of people think that artists are like, uh, autistic or like, oh, uh, we just, you know, it's easy stuff. It just comes out of our head. No, it takes lots of research and, uh, practice. Like I was in art school for five years. You know, and it wasn't like I was smoking weed or drinking either, right? It's like, I think I had, I had, every year I'd have like a glass of wine, one glass of wine a year. But <laughs> five days a week, six days a week, and seven days a week, uh, you know, I was living in a, a one-room apartment for three years with my brother, right? Uh, in a shared, a shared household, but like we, we slept in the same bed, <laughs> I mean, nothing more humble than that. We had our two little desks next, next to each other. That's what we could afford at the time, right? And it's like, and he was working his ass off, you know, trying to survive, you know, his his assignments, you know, and I was working my ass off, you know, helping him and, and making sure that my assignments were, were going. So it's like art is... Uh, yeah, man, it's it's uh, it certainly is a, a fantastic journey. It's hard. It's really hard. It, it's weird because it's, it's not fun. <laughs> no, it's not fun. And I think it's something in which that it is we, like we talked about in the beginning, which is um, it's transforming pain and sadness into something beautiful. And it's almost 
when everything is honky dory, there's no reason to create art Absolutely. because everything's great. Yeah. Everything's awesome when you're part of a team, like a movie. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, are, are there happy artists? <laughs> well, the only happy artists that I know are the ones that are constantly doing work. Mm. Those are the only ones that I know that are like, you know, have this, you know, kind of level business about them because they're, you know, they're organized enough to be like, I'm going to wake up, they're structured, and they get their work done throughout the day. You know, one of these guys is James Jean, um, who's a fan, not just an illustrator, he's a fashion guy and does jewelry. And But man, I've known that guy since he was 18, and I'm just, I'm so proud of what he's done. And uh, uh, he's released like a variety of different illustrated books, I mean, of his own work. Uh, you got to check it out sometime. I mean, I think one of them made the New York Times bestseller list. I mean, among a variety of different things that he does. That's just like, oh, yeah, when I went over to his house, and he was like, oh, yeah, here's this. I, I just finished this illustration. It was, for a, it was a movie poster, and illustrated movie posters don't come along much. And this one's actually done, I think it was in acrylic or something, and I was like, wow, okay, you know. And this guy is so level-headed. Um, He's already, anyway, he's, he's gone through his shit, but at the same time, like, he's able to, you know, create every single day. Um, and he seems absolutely content. It sounds like finding the structure, like you talked about running uh, in the mornings and stuff like that. And so it's finding these, uh, it, art is defined by its borders. And, and so I think the, mo the most successful Constraints, artists. Constraints, right? Exactly. Yeah. You have, all right, I'm only going to be vegan. I'm only going to, I'm going to run this amount and I'm, you know, going to bike and not drive. Um, so it sounds like the more borders you create in your life, healthy borders. Healthy the, borders, The exactly. more that you're able to fully release yourself to e explore in every different direction. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're, you're creating these um, kind of, uh, I mean, for me, and I'm not just looking at it in that sense, right? I'm looking at it not just for, just for my life, right? Which is very important to me, but my family's life. Um, I want to be around to, to help them out. Um, at the same time, you know, climate-wise, like we're going through a, a, a pretty significant thing going on right now, right? Like climate, uh, I don't even know what it's called, right? They say climate change and, and a variety of other terms, but I don't know what that actually means. Like what is going on? We just saw these fires happening. We see on the East Coast significant storms, you know, Category 5 hitting, you know, Florida. You know, it's like again and again. I mean, we had Hurricane Maria and, and Irma hit the Virgin Islands in Puerto Rico. Devastating. They'd never, they'd never had wind speeds ever record. It, they'd never been recorded, right? Um, so I'm trying to at least like try to do my part. It's so small. It's so fucking small. It's like, but I'm trying to like be vegan. Okay, they said be vegan. No eat, don't eat meat because it's right. Okay, don't get a car. Okay, no car. I haven't had a car in 23 years. It doesn't matter. I'm biking to work, right? Um, but I also know that like running is very good for you, right? Ex just general exercise, keep your, keeping yourself going. Because um, that's just one component. Like life for me, art, I mean, I'm not just an, I'm not just an artist. It's like, I want to be a person, you know? It's like art is great. Sometimes I need to take a break. Sometimes I want to take a break for six months from art. I think that's something that like musicians do pretty well is that like, Professional musicians are not constantly playing every single day, right? They'll go on tour, right? They'll they'll do their demos, they'll do their recordings, then they'll go on tour, and then they'll take you know four months off to like not even think about it, or maybe they'll do a little bit of strumming or a little bit of play, right? So there is some time where I like to you know take some time for tea and not be a creative. <laughs> There's a, I'll, I'll have to pull it down later, but um, it's, it, there's a, a poem uh, Garrison Keillor pulled out, something about church bells ringing all the time and celebrations and fireworks. And if, if that's happening all the time. Crescendo. Exactly. And it, you talked about with the game, it has to lead to a crescendo. And if you're just one note the whole time, it's exhausting. Yeah. And it's exhausting for people around you as well. Well, yeah. Imagine everybody like high-fiving all the time. <laughs> ah! It's like... Yeah. The only time a person high fives in reality is when they've gone through the struggle and they've like succeeded at it, right? Or they've at least survived it. You know, that's when you you're like, I swam across the the river and I almost drowned, right? It's like, 
Um, and that's a really other it's a good point, uh, Mark, is like making sure that, you know, it's not always Kool-Aid, right? It's not, you're not always drinking the soda. It's like there's a time of feast and there's a time of famine. Um, there's a time, you know, there's a time to be humble and there's a time to be a little like celebratory of the achievements that you've, you know, had rather than just always ego, right? Like you don't ever want to be like best, best, always, greatest, always. No, there's every company, every person goes through their little <laughs> human experiments. You know, I certainly have. <laughs> uh, uh, something in which that I, I know that uh, I uh, am concentrating on right now, which is um, finding finding peace in the mundane and the slow and the um, and when your profession is something in which that you're you throw you purposely throw yourself in the chaos and uncertainty all the time that when you talk about like your family and your community the people around you they don't want chaos and, and craziness and reinventing the wheel they just want someone that's loving and caring and there for them so uh, how do you turn off the uh, the creative jump into chaos and then into oh man that's easy um, hummingbirds Hearing a hummingbird, like, or birds in general. I love birds. Um, my mom's a, a parrot lady. She loves, she has parrots. I don't want to talk about that. But, um, no, but, like, outside of my house, I see hummingbirds. And they do this. It's not a dance. It's a fight. But you get to watch these hummingbirds. And they, they have these distinctive calls. And they're very high-pitched. And sometimes they're up on their little perch. I have a little hummingbird that she or he is always there on this little leaf, <laughs> literally this one leaf. I'm like, that that leaf, okay. It's been like eight months, that leaf is still there and that that hummingbird is, that's, that's their little perch. And that's where it goes. It's like, this is my property. Anybody comes in and I get to watch that. And I realize that like, man, I had a hard day, but look, this hummingbird is like doing its thing it's doing its work right it's and it's this amazing creature it's it's it like how does it even i mean it's 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 so fast right and it's making these high pitched noises and it's just amazing so i yeah I, I tend to get out of art in that way just looking at nature i like to look outside of art and then you get to see it in nature like then you see the art in the nature and it actually inspires you more. But that's just like a small little, that's just walking out of my house. I think that's what I think everyone should aim to do, which is, um, which we keep circling around it, which is drawing from outside the bubble. Because the more that you just go outside of the bubble, like we have to work in the bubble and be in yeah. the bubble, yeah. and, but it's more about contributing into the bubble. And then when the clock strikes, you leave the bubble so that you can draw from hummingbirds from nature from yeah it is. there's one another reason why i like to ride a bike for example is that you know most people they uh you know they make dinner they're in a box right they go to the bathroom before they go to the bed and it's in a little box go into the bedroom it's in a box wake up in the morning go to the bathroom it's a box make their coffee in a box which is the kitchen get dressed in the box get into their car which is a box go into the work which is a box right so you're box, 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 all the time. And when you're in nature, there's round, there's flat, there's, you know, diagonals, there's all, there's these linear elements that are, you know, out there. There's this entire world. And in fact, the funny thing is, is that we live in a, on a circle, but we live in boxes, right? Isn't that the funny thing? <laughs> it's like, um, and we're used to it. We all live in fucking boxes. <laughs> um... And I love I love that about being on a on a bicycle, for example, is that you're you're completely prone, like to being doored, which I have been, which is not fun. <laughs> Get your arm crushed and a you know a door into your chest, but that's from a long time ago. But the thing is, is that you are prone, like you are, which means that, and that's on a day to day. When I'm going on to work, which I always wear a helmet, by the way, I'm I'm very very cognizant of the world around me rather than I look over <laughs> and I'm in traffic and I would say that 80% of people are on their phones when they're driving mm. they're like and I, they're like okay I have you know they're doing the 80-20 the ratio right 
80% looking, 20% not, right? But even that 20% is a is a scary thing, right? But people are still living in that little box, right? It's kind of interesting. We've got an entire world around us and we only live once. And uh, that's another reason why like to get out a little bit more is is important. You know, it's, it's I know that strange little screen that's been around for the last um, couple of decades is is intriguing, but you know, the majority of, of life for this planet has lived without it for, I don't know, a long time. <laughs> and there's a lot out there. Well, it's interesting to, to have a generation being old geezers, um, yeah. to see a, a generation come up only knowing smartphones and only knowing that little box that's been around for a couple decades. Absolutely. Um, because you, your neural connections get built knowing that as just kind of law and fact. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, it's a little bit hard to disconnect. It is, and I don't know like what what's going to be the case if that if there's a disruptor in that situation. Like, how are people? Uh, I like when I was a kid, my my dad taught me how to drive. You know, at age twelve, he taught me how to drive a stick shift, for example. He taught me how to drive uh, to change a, a the Jeep's you know tire. Right, <laughs> it's like little things like that. You know, getting your hands dirty, getting the lug nuts off and taking the wheel. And, you know, sometimes the tie would drop on your toe and you're like, gah! But it was like, okay, I'm learning, you know, or changing a carburetor, changing a, tra a transmission, um, washing machine, whatever. It's like you're, you're learning those skills as well rather than like, here's my device. I'll just get download this app. <laughs> it's like that's not going to fix it. It's not going to fix the problem. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, is there any emerging technology that you're excited about working with? Um, oh my gosh. Uh, I mean, I'm, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not really looking at the technology. I'm. I'm more looking at uh, foundational art. Um, technology can always be used. I mean, we see VR, right? And VR is going to do a variety of different things. I'm, I'm super excited, excited about VR. Um, definitely like the sculpting capabilities of it is insane. Like you can build, actually you can build worlds now, like <laughs> in 3D, right in the, you know, there's a couple of artists that are doing that. It's like groundbreaking. Um, just to even watch them create the, uh, the environments that they do. Um, so I guess, yeah, maybe VR, but it, again, it all comes down for me. It's like, uh, it's about the art. I know that the tech is out there, um, but without, without the taste, like the tech, you know, isn't going to help yeah. <laughs> in some way. Uh, Moby, thank you for making the time. Absolutely. My pleasure. Yeah.